possiamo dare inizio alla nostra serata, benvenuti a tutti, benvenuti al Museo della Scienza e della Tecnologia Leonardo da Vinci. È una serata bella, particolare, un bellissimo parterre di ospiti, un grande artista che per la prima volta in Italia, per la prima volta naturalmente quindi a Milano e nel nostro museo, porta delle creature immaginarie e straordinarie. Lo fa, qui abbiamo un esempio, con un'arte tra virgolette povera dal punto di vista dei materiali, ma ricchissima dal punto di vista intellettuale, dal punto di vista del mettere insieme eh, quella che è l'evoluzione della specie con la meccanica e naturalmente con l'affatto artistico che ne fa eh, un'opera conosciuta nel mondo e eh, di assoluto livello internazionale. Noi siamo particolarmente orgogliosi di avere con noi questa sera Teo Janssen, che poi presenterò meglio, e che terrà questa sera una lecture riguardo a quella che è la sua arte, il suo stile di vita come artista e quindi questa arte così particolare che ci mette in condizioni questa sera e poi per i tre mesi a seguire di avere un'occasione molto importante di un artista così originale e che naturalmente i nostri diversi pubblici, che abbiamo un pubblico molto ampio per fasce di età, di competenze e di interessi, avranno modo di ammirare. E naturalmente io devo, e beh, lo faccio con grande piacere, dei ringraziamenti a chi ha reso possibile questa iniziativa. E eh, noi abbiamo seguito Teo Jansen negli ultimi anni come appassionati e i colleghi che più hanno, sono sul pezzo su questo tema, lo hanno un po' inseguito eh, e abbiamo avuto la possibilità di constatare che qui ovviamente eh, dei partner e dei risponsi che lo amano, che hanno interesse verso di lui e che ci ha aiutato a realizzare questa stupenda iniziativa. Primo fra tutti Bodmar Piguet, che come sapete è un brand eh, di livello internazionale assoluto nel mondo dell'orologeria, eh, che ha voluto essere il main sponsor di questa iniziativa, di questa edizione, e che qui è rappresentata da Ginga Angara, che eh, questa mattina ha anche eh, detto cose importanti e credo ribadirà eh, questa sera il primo della lecture di Teo. Eh, e li ringraziamo naturalmente perché il sostegno è stato particolarmente generoso e quindi fondamentale per il risultato finale. Eh, con questa mostra inizia anche un altro percorso eh, di rapporto di collaborazione con la, la, la Fondazione Ipsa per la ricerca scientifica, è un'iniziativa che eh, durerà tutto l'anno, questo naturalmente sarà l'episodio più rilevante, ma avremo altre occasioni di collaborazione insieme e qui eh, è rappresentata da diritto direttrice Silvia Misiti, che di nuovo ringrazio eh, e che eh, come fondazione dedica una grande attenzione alla divulgazione scientifica dei programmi fra arte e scienza e quindi qua ci siamo pieni. Eh, siamo inoltre molto grati alla comunità olandese, senza la quale non saremmo riusciti a costruire questa iniziativa. Eh, L'iniziativa è stata sostenuta attraverso KLM, che è l'ufficio al carriero della mostra, e eh, rappresentata da Simone che ne è il marketing coordinator e godiamo del contributo della Modern Fund che ha tra le sue finalità quella di promuovere l'internazionalizzazione dell'arte e della cultura olandese. Naturalmente è indispensabile, è stata indispensabile, preziosissima la partecipazione dell'ambasciata del Regno dei Paesi Bassi e quella del Consul Generale Jon Carbon che poi ci dirà quello che riterrà giusto e opportuno per parte sua in questa circostanza. E infine dobbiamo un particolare ringraziamento al team internazionale di Media Force di Koji e Mia Lima che ha prodotto la mostra collaborando con lo staff di Exhibition Design del museo. E devo dire, non dovrei dirlo perché me la gioco in casa, che mi sembra che me la suoni e me la canti, ma l'Exhibition Design è venuto particolarmente bene e posso dire all'altezza della qualità di quello che viene esposto insieme e eh, grazie quindi ad Alex Boracorsi del Museo che ha dato segno delle sue capacità in questa circostanza. Eh, io non rubo tempo perché al di là del piacere eh, di questi ringraziamenti eh, siete qui non per ascoltare me ma per ascoltare Teo Janssen, ma quindi prima lascio la parola al Consiglio Generale del Regno dei Paesi Bassi per quello che lui riterrà opportuno dirci e poi a Ormar Piguet per la possibilità eh, di dare segno tangibile e qualitativo a tutta l'Unione della natura del loro rapporto di collaborazione e sponsorship. Quindi 
a voi il microfono. Grazie, buonasera a tutti. Che piacere essere qua con tanta gente per un evento tanto speciale. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here. I was informed maybe one year ago about the plans of this museum to bring Theo Janssen to Milan, and I was, uh, I was very thrilled because I know Theo Janssen not in person, but as an artist, and his work is spectacular, and to bring him, to have him in Milan was a dream for me. So the museum of the Gali, made my dream come true. So I would like to thank you very much for that. It's really very special. Two months ago I was here in the museum and Dr. Gali, he, he gave me a tour and I was very impressed by, by the exhibitions, by all the space, by the innovations, by the educational way things are presented. And it's, it's really a very, very special beautiful museum. I think it's really the place where David Janssen should be now with his works. So it's, it feels, for me it feels a little bit like coming home in the, in the museum Leonardo da Vinci. And especially when uh, I was informed that this exhibition will take place here also to remember that it's 500 years ago that Leonardo da Vinci died. You, you can imagine that I was very proud of representing the Netherlands here in Milan to have a Dutch artist coming over for such an event that is really very special and I'm very proud for, about that. When we talk about Theo Janssen, we are talking about one of the most special artists in the Netherlands. He is having exhibitions all over the world traveling around the world because everybody wants to have him and uh, he is in, in television shows if you go to youtube or to internet you will find him all over the place he is he's very much well known so it, it's really great that you have taken the opportunity at the time to come to milan with the use of ordinary PVC, pvc pipes Theo Janssen creates objects which transform into new forms of life. So he's like a creator. These are his own words. He is creating new, new forms of life. And it's, it's amazing to see how the wind literally blows life into these beach animals and how they graciously start to move. His work is very innovative but also very inclusive, as Dr. Gali already mentioned. It doesn't matter how old you are, whether you are very young or old like me, or whether you are highly educated or not educated, everybody loves the works of Theo Janssen because they have a very open character. And I was very happy to see this morning that there was a huge article in the Corriere da Sera, also on the, the front page, and I noticed that also the Italians will love their answer. Now I want to close, and I also would like to thank uh, those who have made this exhibition possible. First, of course, Dr. Gali, together with this amazing team who have worked very hard to make this exhibition possible. Also the sponsors like TLM and the Mondrian Fund in the Netherlands and of course also Alamar Mike and the IPSA Foundation. Without those sponsors these kind of events would not be possible. Last but not least I also would like to thank again Theo Janssen for coming over and making all this possible. I hope that in the coming time many Italians will be able to visit the exhibition. For this evening it's already uh, sold out, uh, but in the, in the coming time the, the museum is organizing different events during the day, but also 
some Dutch evenings, as the museum is calling it, Dutch evenings or Dutch nights, Dream Beast. And the first of that will be already the 7th of March. So uh, I hope that many children, schools, uh, not many people here will be able to visit the exhibition. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for your attention. Theo says, 
The walls between art and engineering are only in our minds. They don't really exist. And I think that when you look at his work, you really get this profound understanding. So thank you very much, all of you, to be here tonight for this very special moment. And a very big thank you also to the museum here, especially to, of course, Ferenc Gali. And I would also like to thank Giovanni Gruppi for making also this dream possible because he was also one of the visionaries who wanted to bring Theo here. And thank you, Theo, for this wonderful journey.
and that is based on the experiences of the Jews of the day before. So the road which they walk is very capricious, very unpredictable. And it brings me somewhere where I could never think of in the beginning. So that's why I'm surprised when the animals are finished, that I'm surprised how beautiful they became. It's not because I was working on beauty, no, it's just because I followed the advices of the Jews. Now I would like to show you a small movie which uh, illustrates the history of the strand beast evolution. Because they evolved during the years, they become better and better surviving. And I would like to ask if you would start the video, please, and I will sit down and wait.
very much. I would like to explain a little bit about the lag system of the beast, which uh, came about in 1991. Uh, so in all strand beasts, you will find a sort of backbone, which makes a circular movement like this. I hope everybody can see this a little bit. At least you can see that as soon as the pencil, which draws the sort of curve down there, as soon as it's on the ground, it draws more or less a straight line. So when it's on the ground, you see it draws a straight line. That means that the, the animal itself draws a straight line as well. So it's, it stays on the same level while walking. And that's a spe very special way of the strapies walking that they don't toss up and down like we do, but they stay on the same level while walking. And that's because of the shape of this curve, which I just will draw by the hand a little bit. Come on. So how it's walking. Oh, this is tape here. Now I see. And they all the tape blocks. Anyway, there's a the curve with a flat bottom. And, um, and the shape of that curve is important for the way the animals walk. But the shape of this curve is very much depending on the length of the tube between the backbone and the pencil. If you have another proportional length, you get a totally different curve down there. And when I started this, I didn't know which proportional length I needed to get this curve. That's why I wrote a computer program in an Atari computer, which is a part of this exhibition, it's standing in the corner over there, that uh, it, the computer could generate a curve with a given proportion of length of tubes. But still, then you have so many possibilities. If the computer would let pass all the possible uh, leg systems with uh, proportions, that it will be on for a hundred thousand years. That's why I needed to write a genetic algorithm for the computer, which means that you use the principle of evolution uh, in a computer, where you don't get all the, maybe the most optimal results, but you come there fast. And that it took several months for the computer to run day and night to generate 30 numbers, which were the lengths of the tubes which I needed to build the system. And then when it was finished, indeed, the animals stayed on the same level while walking. And it's all based, in fact, of, of a proportion of numbers, the 30 holy numbers, you would say. And this is the DNA code of the strand piece. And I published this code on my website already a long time ago. And since then, hundreds and maybe thousands of students, they are building strand beasts in the world using this code. And all these students, they are busy with the numbers and with making it in wood, and they appear on bookshelves in student rooms all over the world. And all these students have the idea that they're having a good time a nice hobby making this plant beast, but the fact is they are used for the reproduction. So they are infected with this plant beast disease, with the numbers, and then they cannot do anything else but making this plant beast. So that's how the plant beast they reproduce, they use students, they use humanity to reproduce. Now I brought one example of this animals. So this is a, uh, an animal made by a guy in Amsterdam called Art Lagerfeld. And this is a 3D printed animal. So it's printed in one piece. And that's what's happening at the moment very much in the world. This printed versions are in all corners of the world, 
and there are DNA codes roaming over the internet, and I must say, this is a mutant. So, Mr. Lagerfeld, he used another DNA code than my code. And I must say, it works quite nice. Maybe it's a better code than my code. And if it's a better code, it will be more, uh, uh, more children on the internet than my code. And what I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, there's a real evolution going on on the internet with DNA codes which change and the animal will become better and better. It's a real evolution and it's totally out of control because this is what's all happening behind my back. The strand beasts, they influence the world without me anymore. So sometimes I have the idea that the strand beasts were in the air before 1990 looking for brains to land in. And I was lucky enough that they landed in my brain and they're using my brain to infect the rest of the world. So you should be careful when you go down there. It might be infected by the strand beasts. So I would like to tell you something about the neural system of the beast. So, Mr. Foucault, would you like to keep it? Can you keep it, can keep it just up so everybody can see? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. So, hey. Muchas gracias. What the It's a, a sort of uh, O-ring at the end, and it fits exactly into an aperture. So you have a piston and a pump. Now you, you will see these this wings up there on the beast. When they catch the wind, they start waving. You have seen it in the video. And then the crankshaft starts turning in this thing, and the crankshaft is connected with this pump. So this pump goes up and down, just like a bicycle pump, and it pumps air not in a bicycle tire, but in pet bottles which are on the beast. They press the wind into the bottles, you would say. And this is spare energy, the, area, the animals need in case that the wind falls away on the beast. Because if you connect a pump like this with the bottles, and you open the valve here, then this jumps out, and you have a sort of muscle. A muscle is nothing but an object which becomes longer or shorter on command. And the command is given by a valve which opens here, that it jumps out, and the valve you can see as a nerve cell which triggers the muscle. Now, I have a nerve cell here. This is a nerve cell, and maybe you, Mr. the camera can, yes, and close, 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 close. So, I take off the top. If I blow air in here, the air goes in here, it comes out of here. So, you have, this is connected, but if I push in this piston here, it's blocked. So, this is nothing but a valve. Open, close, open, close. This valve is controlled by the small piston, which is under here. So if I blow here, you see that it pushes this piston in here and closes the valve, right? Now, it's gonna be more technical, right? <laughs> so, if you see this as the input, and this is the output, the output is opposite from the input. And I see everybody knowing it, but I'm afraid I will have to be more clear to you. And if you see this as a person, look at this as a person. And this is the mouth, and this is the ear, then the mouth says the opposite from what it hears. So if it hears there's air, it closes here, the mouse says, no, there's no air. So this is why I call this person a liar. It says the opposite from what it is. Now, 
imagine that Mr. Fulton is a liar, he's not, but let imagine that Dr. Gali is a liar, I'm a liar anyway, so, and I say to Dr. Gali, yes, you are a liar, what did you say to Mr. Fulton? He, he says no, you hear no, and what you say to me? I hear yes, and I say no. So in this conversation of three liars, I changed my opinion. I started off with a yes, and they ended up with a no. That's what you have with an uneven number of liars. Then you have a so-called dynamic system. With two liars, you can say the same thing. You have a static system, but with an uneven number of liars, you have a thing which changes all the time. And I have three liars here. So, this is Dr. Kali, this is Mr. Fubon, and this is me. And we are connected, so my mouth is connected with the ear of uh, Dr. Kali, and so on. But I put some air, which is not here by the wind. And let's see what the liars have to say to each other. They don't say anything. Because there's no air anymore in the so. So they say yes and no, just like we did. And as you know, you can see. Uh, a yes as a one and a no as a zero. With these kind of liars, you can switch zeros and ones just like in a computer. So, what you see here is the future of the strand beast brain. And the brain can take decisions based on the outer information given by senses, like the sand feeler, the wind feeler. And they give information to the brain, and the brain can take decisions uh, to, to steer the muscles what to do. For instance, if the animal is in the sea, it feels the water, and then it should run out of the sea again. So I would like to show the, the water feeler a little bit later. At least I will just show it to you, and later demonstrate it, maybe if we can re-pump out the bottles. So, this tube is vital for surviving on the beach. It goes off the ground about this height, and it sucks in air all the time. And as soon as it arrives into the sea, it swallows the water and feels the resistance of the water. Then some liars switch over in here, and then the animal has to run out of the sea, give the signal to run out of the sea. Now, later we will demonstrate this with a, a glass of water. First, I would like to uh, show you the Animalis Siamesis, which is on this side. Uh, so, all the animals here in the exhibition, they are extinct. In spring, I always go to, to the beach with a new animal, which I made in the winter. They are doing the summer, the whole kind of experiments on the beach. Uh, in the fall, I'm a little bit wiser about how to survive better on the beach with the, the wind and the, the sand. And at that moment, I declare the animal extinct. And they go to the boneyard. And these boneyards are adopted in exhibitions like this. But some, and sometimes we can reanimate an extinct animal. And that's what we, we are going to do in a few moments with the Animalis Siamesis standing here. So I would like to invite you to stand around here a little bit. After the reanimation of the Animalis uh, Siamesis, I would like to take you down and give a sort of tour in the exhibition. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to give you in the hands of the crew which I, uh, my friends coming from Holland and they will try to reanimate the extinct 
animados via Jesus. And we pump it up with a compressor instead of the wind. And let's see if the animal is still able to walk on the compressed air. It was going to move the wind. Okay. So the wings are pulled in now at the moment, but they can stretch. As you can see, they can stretch when the wind is more mild then they need more surface so they can be a little bit bigger. Yes. And when the wind catches the wings, they start to move. It's a little bit, yeah, it's happening. Some more support in the middle, I guess. Yes. It's an old lady, right? It's a fossil beast. <laughs> and let's see. Yes. So this way it pumps up the bottles with air. So there are pumps here which push the shoulders apart of the beast. And so there are signals are given by nerve cells which are connected with the crankshaft. some other beasts and the, the exhibition built up so beautiful here in this 